So we're looking at a spectrum of brain dysfunctions. In other words, you may be here look, looking about autism or autism spectrum disorders. What I'm describing to you applies to any type of brain dysfunction. And as I say, we're scanning children from 2 to 92. So that even though we're focused on the autism spectrum at this point in time, uh, this technology exists and we can help you with this, whether this is a, a person who's got chronic fatigue syndrome, if somebody's got a traumatic brain injury, somebody has questions about dementia or stroke or what have you. Today the focus of this course on what is the brain function in individuals on the autism spectrum? How does this information help you? Now, in terms of diagnosis of autism, all of you know, I'm assuming that you know, is that the diagnosis of autism is really based upon clinical observation. So we're not using brain function imaging to make any diagnosis uh, of autism itself. Also is, is that, and as you work with physicians and healthcare providers, many of them, when they think about looking at the brain, if there's a question about it, the first thought of most doctors is anatomy. So one of the first things they do is order an anatomy scan, an MRI study. And there's enough data now and experience to know that in most individuals on the autism spectrum, and I think some of you are shaking your heads, you already know, is that the MRI scans look normal. Now, it's not a bad thing. It just means that this is really not a, an anatomic abnormality. It's a brain function abnormality. So it makes sense to use some brain function imaging, and we're going to talk about that in detail, because virtually all the individuals on the autism spectrum have some atypical brain function. Notice here, I'm not saying there's anything abnormal. It's just atypical. So we no longer speak about people or, or describe scans in terms of somebody's abnormal. They're not things, they're just atypical function. And because this is actually a neurological condition, and I know that more body areas are involved in the uh, autism, but right now my area of uh, focus is on the brain. So we're talking about neurological applications. We know that we don't exactly know what is the cause of autism. So we're not trying with this technology, we're not trying to find the cause of this. We're simply saying others are working on finding the cause how can we help you now with your individual who's struggling and with whom you're struggling? How can we help you by looking at the function of this person? Consider that this is a medical condition. It's not a psychiatric condition. It's not a mental illness. There's actual brain dysfunction. Let's look at it, and how can we give you a clue about what's the next best thing to do? And just so that you know what's happening is we're going from the standard anatomy picture. So this is a cross-section of a human brain. Obviously, this one is post-mortem, but because uh, we're not doing any brain biopsies like this in vivo. But just what I want you to just get, again, the concept over here is how do we go from knowing what this brain was doing if we just do an anatomy scan, which is the MRI, it gives us great detail of all the soft tissue in here. How do we get to looking at functional information which happens to be displayed in this color scale? I'll describe some of these things to you. I just want you to get the concept here is this, is that this is the anatomy scan and it looks okay. And a lot of people talk about, well, what's happening about all the connections, which are these white areas in the brain. In other words, the brain cells that are actually doing a lot of the work are these gray zones, and that's why they're called the gray cells. The white fiber tracks over here are the connections. So this is kind of like thinking of a computer. There's, there's the wiring between the computer chips. And then there's the computer chips out here. And also, what is the software that's running in those computer chips? So we're looking beyond the connections. We're actually looking to what's going on in the cells themselves. And we have some scanning techniques that enable us to tell you which areas of the brain are functioning at a higher level or a lower level? What is typical and what's atypical? Now, I just comment just briefly about the fiber tracks over here because the most prominent person that you and I know in the autism world is Dr. Temple Grandin. And last year when she was giving a presentation, she showed this slide. So I'm going to show two slides about her, and I'm using them with her permission. 
And she said, wow, she got this scan of all the fiber tracks in her brain. And she said, well, because of knowing this, and remember, Dr. Grandin is very much about structure and relationship. So to her, this helped her to understand, especially when she pointed out, she said, if you take some of this information apart and you just look at certain specific areas of the fiber tracks, she said, look in her, they discovered that she has a lot more connections in the fiber tracks than does the sort of normal age matched subject. Now that can tell you something about how somebody's brain is working. The point I want to make though is, is that, remember I said the white matter is the fiber tracks. What this approach does not do, it's not bad, it's not wrong, what it doesn't do is it doesn't tell you what's going on in the brain cells that are all the way around over here. You literally don't know what's happening. Now clearly, if there's some breakdown in the communication pathways and the connections, there's gonna be some dysfunction. But the key issue, what we're focusing on, is what are the brain cells themselves doing beyond just the connection? So we're transitioning now from looking at, this is the real anatomy, the MRI aspect of that. We're going to talk now about how do we actually get these functional images.